Okay, a couple of words on pulleys. Pulleys only change the direction of a force. For example, if you have a pulley out here and they say the, the rope is tied to the wall, if I'm pulling here with the tension, with a force, the tension uh, is going to be the same throughout the pulley. All the pulley does is just change the direction, and we should know that from statics. Same thing if you have a mass instead of a tension. If you've got, you got something pulling here and there's a tension, the tension is going to be the same on both sides of the pulley. And the angle doesn't make any difference because the pulley just changes the direction of the force uh, just to changes the direction of the tension. It doesn't really add anything. Now, in this case, we're we're talking about massless pulleys uh, with no friction. Uh, later in the later in the course, we'll talk about pulleys that actually have mass and that may have some friction. And then these uh, assumptions don't apply anymore. But uh, with massless, frictionless pulleys, the tension is going to be equal to the tension on both sides. Now, how about uh, if you have two masses uh, like this? Well, the tension is still the same. However, uh, in order to analyze this thing, um, you have to uh, you have to draw separate free body diagrams of the two masses, and we'll do some examples of that. But here, just bear in mind is that uh, if if one of them has an acceleration down, then the other one has an acceleration up, and, and you can say that the tension is equal to the tension, but the a uh, the acceleration of one is equal to the negative acceleration of the other one. Um, so when we define positive. Uh, we'll define a positive direction or something like that. You'll see that the accelerations are opposite. Okay, how about if you got boxes tied together? Let's, here's just a, a little simple inclined plane illustration, but let's say that we have a box down here trying to slide down. There's a pulley and uh, the rope is one over the pulley here, and then you've got a couple more boxes on the horizontal portion of the, of the mechanism. What we're going to say is that the pulley, again, changes the direction, but it keeps the same tension on both sides of the pulley. So if, you, if this one goes down, you've got a tension here, it's going to be the same tension here as, and, it's, and that's going to be pulling this one. However, the tension is not the same between these two guys. And uh, in order to analyze this, you're going to have to, uh, we'll have to break it up and draw separate free body diagrams. So, but they do, but since they are tied together, they all do have the same acceleration. So A1 equals A2 equals A3. They're all going to be going in that same direction and the accelerations will all be the same. However, the tensions are not the same. And in order to analyze this, we'll have to draw separate free body diagrams. And we'll do a little illustration of that. Okay, so let's, uh, let's look at boxes tied together real quick. Here's a, here's a mass here and a mass here, and we're going to pull this with a force. Clearly, the force here is going to be that same tension, but that tension is not going to be the same as that tension. We, we can treat these system as long as they as long as they're go, moving together we can treat them as a system such that we can say the sum of the forces in the x is equal to the sum of the masses times the acceleration in the x we can treat it as a system uh, again as long as they're um, as long as they're moving together. In this case, we're going to say that there's no friction. Mu is equal to zero, so we can make the analysis a little cheaper or a little easier. So I'm going to say that F1 or T1, that F here is equal to T1, which is equal to the sum of the masses, M1 and M2, times acceleration. And if I put some numbers in here, mass 1 is equal to 20, mass 2 is equal to 40, and the force is equal to 500, I can find out that the acceleration is equal to 500 divided by those two masses of 60 kilograms, and I can find an acceleration of 8.33. Now, that's the tension here, is the same as the force. How about the tension here? The only way to find the tension in the middle is to break them up. So all you do is you isolate uh, one of the masses. So let's isolate M. Let's draw a separate free body diagram of the first mass, and we'll say that we have a T1 going here and a T2 going there. And then we draw uh, our sum of the forces equation. Sum of the forces in the X is mass times acceleration in the X. So I got T1, but this one's going negative, so I got negative T2 is equal to mass times acceleration. I can solve for T2 easily enough and say that T2 is equal to 333 newtons. We found that T1 was equal to 500 newtons. So definitely the the tension in the in the rope here is 500. It drops to 333 down there because it's only pulling one of the masses. In this case, the the force is pulling both masses. All right. So the first time I uh, I isolated M1, let's isolate M2 and see what we get. So if I isolate M2, we can see that we got a mass and a tension T2. And all I do is some of the forces in the X is mass times acceleration in the X. The only force I've got is T2. I got a mass. That should be 
40 newtons, not 400 newtons, or 400, 40 kilograms, not 400 kilograms. Anyway, so I can solve for the force 40 kilograms till that, and that equals uh, 333 newtons for the force. And again, that matches what we were doing before. Okay? All right, here's another example of system work. Um, when we have um, a box uh, on a cart, uh, as long as they move together, you can treat this as a system. So let's say that we have a cart here and a box sitting on top of it, and we're going to pull it with force P. We've got a, a, an acceleration vector going this way. So again, if it's not slipping, I can say the sum of the forces in the X is mass times acceleration in the X. The um, only force I've got in the X direction is P, and it's going to be equal to the sum of the masses times acceleration in the X. That works pretty well. However, if it's slipping, I've got a little different equation. And what I have to do is try to separate the two pieces, the box and the cart, into separate free body diagrams and do separate analyses. So let's draw the free body diagram of the, of the, of the box first. I draw the box. I have an mg of the box. I have a normal force. We know that it's accelerating in this direction, don't we? Because the whole system is accelerating in that direction. The only thing that could be accelerating the box is the force of friction. The force of friction has to be pulling it in that direction for it to have an acceleration in that direction. So I can sum the forces in the x as mass times acceleration in the x. The force of friction is equal to the mass times the acceleration of the box. And if, I am, if I'm slipping, then the force of friction is the maximum, which is equal to mu normal, which is equal to mu mg, which is equal to the mass times acceleration. And I can find that the uh, maximum acceleration of the box, the maximum it can be, is equal to mu g. Again, when it's going in a, on, a lev on level ground, that's the maximum acceleration would be mu g. Now we look at the, uh, the cart itself, and I draw a separate free body diagram of the cart. So I got, a, got it, and I got the, the force P is pulling on the cart, and we have to bring back uh, equal opposite reactions from the box onto the cart. So the normal force comes down and the force of friction, equal opposite, goes in that direction. In order to find out the acceleration of the cart now, I say some of the forces in the X is mass times acceleration in the X. I got a positive P, but I got a negative force of friction. The negative force of friction comes from up here, which is actually mu, uh, mu mg from before, or from above. But P minus the force of friction is equal to the mass only of the cart. I do not include the mass of the box when I'm doing a free body diagram of the cart. So my, my complete equation is P minus force of friction is mass 2 times acceleration of the cart. Now what you may notice is that the box has a maximum acceleration based on the friction. The cart does not have a maximum acceleration. In other words, if I, if I put a very large P here, I will have a larger uh, acceleration of the cart. I can't change the force of friction because that depends on the mu mg from above. But if I increase p, I will definitely increase the acceleration of the cart, which means that it can be greater than the uh, it can be greater than the acceleration of the box. It will not be less than the acceleration of box in general because if it's less than the acceleration, the, if it's less than the maximum acceleration of the box, that means they're traveling together. That means they're not slipping, and there's no relative slip. So, because the cart can have a greater acceleration, sometimes we will need to analyze the difference between them. And so we will look at the relative acceleration equation of the acceleration of the box is equal to the acceleration of the cart plus, that's a plus sign, plus the acceleration of the box with respect to the cart. And we recall that, there, that the, whenever we see them alone here, those are the actual or the absolute or relative to the ground kind of accelerations. And this will be our relative term saying the box is accelerating as if the cart was standing still. So uh, if, I'm, if I'm standing on the cart, what does the acceleration of the box look like to me? Okay, so here's a, here's a, um, a problem that illustrates uh, this, this concept, I believe. And uh, here we have a conveyor belt it's, the rollers are moving in this direction, and that means it's pulling the box along in this direction, and the box is not slipping. Uh, we're saying that it's moving at four meters per second, and what we want to do is find out the shortest time possible that the belt can stop so that the package does not slide on the belt. 
So we're going to be moving in this direction and put on the brakes, but we don't want the box to continue to slip on the, on the, on the conveyor belt. So the shortest time possible, we'll be looking for ex uh, maximum acceleration. So let's draw a free body diagram of the box itself. So it's got an MG and a normal force. And because it's moving in this direction, that's a negative x direction if we call that our positive direction. It's moving in a negative direction and it's slowing down, which means that the acceleration is going in that direction. So if that's our positive direction, then we know that acceleration is that direction and the force friction has to be moving in that direction as well because it's lined up with, uh, with the acceleration. Now we can draw our, our, our equation, some of the forces in the, mac uh, the, the maximum the maximum force of friction will cause the maximum acceleration. The maximum force of friction is when it's slipping or a pending slip. And that's when mu normal occurs, which is equal to mu g, uh, mu mg, and uh, that's going to be equal to the mass of the box times the maximum acceleration. Those masses cancel, and so we can say that the max acceleration is mu g, which is 0.2 times 9.81, which is equal to 1.92 meters per second squared. Okay, so that's the maximum acceleration for the box to not slip. Um, so how long does it take? Uh, we know that the force of friction is equal to a constant because it's mu normal. That means the acceleration is equal to a constant. And if the acceleration is a constant, then the constant acceleration equations apply. And we can say that it begins with 4 meters per second. It ends at zero. We know there's an acceleration, and we can solve for the time. So when you do that, plug those things in here, I say that at time is equal to 2.04 seconds for it to stop. And that's the fastest it can stop without the box slipping on the cart. Okay? So again, that's fairly simple. Uh, let's complicate it just a little bit. And we'll say that the, instead of slowing down at uh, in 2.04 seconds, let's say that it slows down more rapidly, say 1.5 seconds. If it slows down that uh, in that short a time, then slippage does occur. In other words, it, it, that's too fast for the belt to slow down for the box to not slip, which means the box slips relative to the belt, and uh, we need to figure that out. So how long then does it take for the box to stop under that scenario? Well, if we look at the free body diagram of the box, it doesn't change. It's still got an mg, it's still got a normal force. If it is slipping, then the force of friction is definitely maximum. Uh, in, our, in the beginning part of the problem, we said it was just about to slip, it's impending slip, but in this case, it's definitely slipping. So the force of friction is still mu normal, which means that the equation still applies. Force of friction is mass times acceleration. A is still 1.962. The velocity is still the, the same. The ending velocity is the same. That means that it still takes 2.04 seconds to stop. In other words, there's no change when it comes to the box. The belt, however, does come to stop within 1.5 seconds. So what happens is that the box is now slipping relative to the belt and we need to find out how far it slips on the belt. Okay? And because of that, uh, so let's find out what the acceleration of the, uh, of the belt is. So the belt does the same acceleration, same constant acceleration equation. It ends at zero. It begins at zero, uh, negative four meters per second. In this case, we don't know the acceleration, but we do know the time, and we can find out that, take, that the acceleration is 2.667 meters per second squared. And in this case, we, have the rel we need to use the relative e acceleration equation, and we're going to say that the acceleration of the box is equal to the acceleration of the belt plus the acceleration of the box with respect to the belt. Okay. So plug in those, again, those are the actuals. We've already solved for those actual accelerations for under both scenarios. So what I can do then is find out what the acceleration of the box with respect to the belt is, plug in those two actuals, and I see that it is equal to negative 0.7047 meters per second squared. Now I can again use a constant acceleration equation to find out how far that it goes under with this acceleration and with this amount of time. So looking at the box, the box stops after 2.04 seconds. The slippage is that I'm looking for how much slip it is. Uh, I have no relative position, difference in position at the beginning of the problem. I have no relative velocity at the beginning of the problem. Uh, 
What I have though is now one half at squared, so that's one half. My, this is my relative uh, acceleration, and 2.04 seconds is the amount of time that the box slips, and I can find out that it takes 1.462 meters of relative slip on the belt for the box to stop. So, depending on what my drawing looks like, uh, you know, it could it could slip from from here to here. Um, depending on what the uh, what the dimensions were, so it's it's got quite a bit of slip, 1.4 meters uh, of slip during the time that it stops. Anyway, I hope that this is helpful for you, and uh, we'll do some more in class.